Hi everyone, my name is Katie and my talk is called Design, a Developer's Secret Weapon. So as programmers, we love solving complex problems. And that's really great because people are incredibly complex. It's our job as developers to build things for people that are both functional and usable. We make things that are functional by writing good code, and we make sure that the things we build are usable by implementing good user experience design. Merging those two creates a great product. Now, if you're sitting in your seat cringing at the word design, just hear me out for a second, and let me explain why we, as developers, should care about design. Design is the interface between people and technology. It's the glue that makes sure the technology we built meet the needs of the people who use it. If we write thousands of lines of code and choose to ignore design completely, the only possible result we'll get from that is that no one will use the products we build, and all our hard work will be for naught. But if we strive to create good experiences for people, they'll love using the things we build, and we'll get to keep making awesome things for them. Soon, most of us here today will go on to work as professional, full-time developers. And what if I told you that design is going to be an extremely important part of your career? It's essential for modern developers to learn how to work on cross-functional teams. So that means if you understand the language that your designers and product managers speak, you'll end up spending less time fixing design issues that could have be been avoided in the first place, and you'll become a much more effective team member. You want to be that go-to developers that designers and PMs love working with. So what exactly is user experience design? You might have heard the phrase tossed around in the tech community, and it might seem buzzwordy or elusive, but it's actually quite simple. User experience is the combination of a product's look, feel, and usability. Look is its visual aesthetic. Feel refers to the emotions people experience when they use it. And usability is whether or not people can understand how it works and if they're able to accomplish what they set out to do. Just as we use Big O to estimate the efficiency of our code, it's helpful to keep this basic formula in mind when considering the overall user experience of our products. Now, let's take a look at what happens when poor design decisions are made. I'm sure we've all seen a form like this. It has five different requirements that a user's password must meet in order to be considered a valid password. So unless your user is super diligent about storing all of their passwords, chances are they're going to forget their password next time they try to log in. On this select menu, users are supposed to pick the month and year of their credit card's expiration date. Imagine having to scroll and scroll in order to select the month you want. So simply having users type in the, expi the expiration date, which, was, which would be four characters, would have been a much better design decision in this case. This is a sign directing visitors to rooms on the left and right. However, it's pretty much useless because it's unclear which arrow belongs to which group of rooms. An easy fix for this would be to just add some space between the two groups. Since proximity creates associations between groups, by separating the two, we can clarify which arrow belongs to which text. And this. <laughs> I have so many questions. Like, how did this even happen, right? <laughs> So the examples we just saw are all instances of poor design, and people might have experienced some minor inconvenience or frustration, but they were relatively harmless, right? Let's now see some examples where bad design decisions lead to more serious consequences. Does anyone know what seatbelts and medicine have in common? Well, turns out both are less safe for women. When safety regulations were first imposed on automakers in the 60s, regulators advocated for using two crash test dummies, a male crash test dummy in the 95th percentile and a female crash test dummy in the 5th percentile. That would mean only 5% of men are larger than the male crash test dummy, and only 5% of women would be smaller than the female crash test dummy. However, automakers pushed back so hard that eventually, regulators were forced to lessen their requirements until they only had to test on one crash, one crash test dummy, a 50th percentile male, the, the size of an average man. And as a result, female drivers are 47% more likely to be seriously injured in a car crash. It wasn't until 2011 
that the first female crash test dummies were required in automobile safety testing. And it's the same story for biomedical and clinical research, which for a long time was based on the assumption that male bodies are representative of all bodies. However, it's known that women and men differ in their susceptibility to various risks and side effects and can respond to medical treatments differently. And as a result of testing drugs primarily on males, eight out of the 10 prescription drugs that were withdrawn from the US market in the 2000s were withdrawn because they caused statistically greater health risks for women. A few years ago, a young girl who had cancer was receiving tr uh, chemo treatment medicine at the hospital. The medicine was incredibly strong and it required prehydration and post-hydration for three days with an IV fluid. So after her <coughs> nurses administered the medicine to her, uh, they were going through this complex user interface, trying to log all the data that they had to record, and they missed a crucial piece of information, which was that the patient was supposed to be given three, three days of IV hydration. And when the morning nurse came in the next day, she found out that the patient died of toxicity and dehydration. Most of us here probably remember the controversy of the 2000 election, where it was unclear whether Al Gore or George W. Bush had won. It basically boiled down to anomalies in Florida polls, and as four counties in Florida came under scrutiny of the investigators, it became clear that a big part of the problem was the design of this ballot. Voters had to punch a hole in the spine of the ballot to mark which candidate they wanted to pick. And while it was decently clear which option was George Bush, the one at the very top, uh, the, the option for Al Gore was not so obvious. And as a result, many voters who intended to vote Al Gore accidentally <laughs> voted for the reform candidate, Pat Buchanan. So some people say that you either have design intuition or you don't. I say that's false. Like programming, it's simply a skill you can practice and build over time. And here are some simple design principles that will help us think about the expectations and goals of our users. Remember, you are not always your user. When building things, we need to be inclusive of people of all backgrounds. This means building in considerations for different ethnicities, genders, ages, abilities, and more. Whenever possible, we should strive to make sure that all people can have equitable access to our products. We want to reduce the amount of time people have to take in order to decide what to do inside of our application, but at the same time, we want to avoid overwhelming users with all of the features at once. So strive to find a happy medium between visibility of your features and simplicity. It's incredibly important to communicate to your users what's going on behind the scenes. Keeping your users aware of the system status is essential to building trust with your users. This is especially important for multi-step processes where users can easy easily get lost or confused without cues guiding them along. Let them know what their progress is and how many more steps there are ahead. It's important to give feedback. Did they succeed? Did they fail? The worst was when you do something and the system doesn't tell you what just happened. Always make sure you give your users feedback so they know how to proceed. And you should anticipate people making mistakes inside your app. They'll do things by accident or maybe change their minds. So let your users fail and try to minimize the consequence of their failure. When building products, the most essential design questions you should ask are, who are my users? What are they trying to achieve? What are their expectations? And what are my own assumptions and biases? To me, the most important, the most exciting part about building products is that real people in the world are going to be using the things that we build. How cool is that? A mistake people make all the time is that they think they understand a problem that people are having and they go ahead and build a product uh, and, and they launch it to the market and you know, as a result, no one, no one uses their product and they're left kind of baffled. Um, please don't do that. <laughs> Before building stuff, make sure to go out and talk to people so that you can understand their needs and problems in a deep and nuanced way 
before you start coding. It'll save you a lot of time, money, and headache, I promise. And after you have a working prototype, make it a priority to watch people use the thing that you built. Ask them what they expect to happen at each step and note what confuses them. You'll be surprised at how much you learn from watching people use your products. Test early and often so that you can validate your assumptions and see what works. Iterate and then test again. And all of us are here are developers, but we're also consumers of technology. We know what it feels to be frustrated or, or delighted by the products we use in our daily lives. So I encourage you to think about your interactions with technology and analyze why it is you like or dislike certain design choices. Look, feel, and usability are helpful criterion for evaluating the effectiveness of our designs. And this is a fantastic way to ingrain design thinking into your brain. So to wrap up, I just want to say that building things for people is an incredible privilege that we shouldn't take lightly. Embracing design thinking as developers can help us build functional and usable products that improve the daily lives of our families, friends, and even people we don't know. And I just want to leave you with one final question, which is, what problems do you want to solve? For who? And how will it change the world? Thank you.